Mark chapter 10 opens with a section on divorce in a fairly stereotypical setting. Then Jesus left that place and went to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan River. Again crowds gathered to him and again, as was his custom, he taught them. Then some Pharisees came and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of dismissal and divorce her. But Jesus said to them, He wrote this commandment for you because of your hard hearts. But from the beginning of creation he made them male and female. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together let no one separate. In the house once again, the disciples asked him about this. So he told them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her, and if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. It's interesting that Mark says, as was his custom in the beginning of this chapter, suggesting that he may be getting a bit self-conscious about reiterating the same themes. Anyway, the issue this time was not a device to sharp his disciples, but a device used to shoehorn in the writer's personal theology and views on marriage. Then verse 13, Now people were bringing little children to him for him to touch, but the disciples scolded those who brought them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not try and stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, he placed his hands on them and blessed them. Mark chapter 9 ended with a discussion of the value of humility and of children, and this return to children completes a Markian sandwich where two discussions of children surround a discussion about marriage. This is my view, and it may be beyond what you see in the text. With these Markian sandwiches, the outer story or the bread of the sandwich generally informs the interpretation of the inner story or the filling. Why is Mark labouring the sanctity of marriage and the evil of divorce? Is divorce intrinsically undesirable? Is it anathema in the eyes of God? Is it because of the effect it has on one or other of the married partners? Mark is basically saying it's none of those things. Divorce is undesirable because of the effect it has on the children. You may not agree with my interpretation of what Mark is thinking here. But if you agree, you must also agree that Mark has a pretty keen insight into the importance of marriage, and it makes you wonder if perhaps the author of Mark has some unfortunate experience in this direction. Of course, if these comments originate from a historical Jesus, maybe that historical Jesus had some insight into the sanctity of marriage. Possibly because he did not come from a stable family, perhaps because he was an illegitimate child. Anyway, verse 17. Now, as Jesus was starting out on his way, someone ran up to him, fell on his knees and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honour your father and mother. The man said to him, Teacher, I have wholeheartedly obeyed all these laws since my youth. And Jesus looked at him. He felt love for him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell whatever you have and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But at this statement the man looked sad and went away sorrowful, for he was very rich. Then Jesus looked around him and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astonished at these words, but again Jesus said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and replied, This is impossible for mere humans, but for God, all things are possible for God. Peter began to speak to him, Look, we have left everything to follow you. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, there is no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mothers or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive in this age a hundred times as much homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, all with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. 
Jesus' explanation of this to the disciples is interesting. In verse 25, the eye of the needle here refers to the eye of a sewing needle. And of course, it's impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. So it's impossible for the rich to be saved. A story has been circulating for hundreds of years about a gate in Jerusalem called the eye of the needle. It's a false story. An odd thing about this section is how illogical it is. Jesus says it's impossible for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples recognise this as being a statement of the impossible and they ask, then who can be saved? Jesus replies that this is impossible for humans, but for God all things are possible. He doesn't see any distinction between the rich and the poor. Something Peter's not too pleased about in verse 28. And in response, Jesus basically fudges it. Then from verse 32 on, we have the third prediction of Jesus' death. They were on the way going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was going ahead of them and they were amazed, but those who followed him were afraid. He took the twelve aside again and began to tell them what was going to happen to him. Look, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and experts in the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him severely and kill him. Yet after three days he will rise again. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. He said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Permit one of us to sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or be baptised with the baptism I experience? They said to him, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and you will be baptised with the baptism I experience. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to give. It is for those for whom it has been prepared. Now when the other ten heard this, they became angry with James and John. Jesus called them and said to them, You know that those who are recognised as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions use their authority over them. But this is not the way among you. Instead, Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is another object lesson in humility, but verse 45 does contain a rare allusion in Mark, saying the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. That is not an explicit statement of the doctrine of vicarious atonement through Jesus' death, but it is getting very close. The final part of this chapter is the healing of Bartimaeus, verse 46. They came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many scolded him to get him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man and said to him, Have courage, get up, he is calling you. He threw off his cloak, jumped up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man replied, Rabbi, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the road. And that's the end of chapter 10. This miracle contains one of those odd details that doesn't seem required by Mark's narrative and suggests a real historical origin. Not only is the blind man's name given as Bartimaeus, but also his father Timaeus and city Jericho. I'll discuss these odd details in another video because they're not limited to one chapter. Compared to some of the previous miracles, this one is pretty uncomplicated. Jesus doesn't touch him, no spit, no partial recovery. Just go, your faith has healed you. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the road. And that's it. Why is this miracle there? Note what Bartimaeus knows about Jesus. Recall that in my video on chapter 1 I listed the people in Mark's Gospel who know who Jesus is. There's God, Jesus, the writer and the reader. Then there are the unclean spirits that Jesus casts out, and the one other person is the centurion we will meet in the crucifixion scene. But Bartimaeus comes quite close. He heard it was Jesus of Nazareth and began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
he made this identification while he was still blind. He then called him Rabbi, so he never actually calls him the Son of God. But to know him as the Son of David is unique in Mark's Gospel. This is the second time David is mentioned in Mark's Gospel, the first being in chapter 2 connected with the showbread incident. And there are a couple more references in later chapters, but none of them assert that Jesus is David's son or even descended from David. If Mark was trying to introduce the idea of Jesus being descended from David, this is a very odd way of doing it. This does have more the look of some garbled third-party source that he's gotten hold of. Chapter 10 is one of Mark's shorter chapters, and it's a bit of a mix of different things. The overall impression is more one of a collection of stories from different sources than it is of a deliberate propaganda piece with a specific agenda. 